pleased to have uh, George Barnett with us here uh, today. He's uh, chair of the Department of Communication at the University of California at Davis. Uh, George and I go back a long time. I was just leaving Michigan State as a grad graduate, well, a, new, a newly minted uh, assistant professor about the time George was getting there to do his uh, PhD work. So I thought that I probably knew him longer than almost anybody else uh, in the room, but I just learned from Katie McLaughlin, sitting in the back there, that uh, <coughs> she was at the University of Illinois when George was an undergraduate there. She knew George, and George's advisor was also on her committee. So that's an uh, interest. So she goes back even farther than, than uh, I do with George. George has published extensively in the areas of cognition and communication and social networks. Uh, he has uh, been on the faculty at a number of universities, most recently uh, at the State University of New York and Buffalo, where he was for many years. And then about three years ago, I guess it was, he came to California and joined the faculty uh, at the University of California uh, at Davis. Um, he has uh, published uh, many articles in the area of telecommunications and globalization. And he is currently serving as the president of the International Network for Social Network Analysis. And just recently completed his role as editor of the International Encyclopedia of Social Networking. We have a lot of people here who are interested in networking and if you want to know any facts, figures, details, or anything about social networking, he'd be a good guy to talk to. So, I've known George for a long time. We're really delighted to have him be here. And the topic of his, uh, of his talk this morning is the Global Telecommunication Network and Cultural Convergence. Welcome, George. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, I think I overprepared. I have enough slides to go on for about a week. Um, and so if I rush through them, understand um, that I'm rushing through. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about today is, of course, Um, is the International Telecommunication Network. Um, let me begin with what I've been working on for probably the last 20 years now, and that is the International Telephone Network. Um, I have data here on 31 points in time from 1978 to 2009. The data come from two sources, the first from AT&T up from 78 to 90, and from 91 to 2009 <coughs> uh, from telegeography, that's data from the ITU, um, which basically is the millions of minutes of telephone time between uh, <coughs> pairs of country, um, and for 2009, there were 212 countries. Um, the correlations between the data sets between 2000 and 2009 range from 0.927 to 1, with the mean of 967. So controlling for the time lag produced a coefficient alpha of 997. So in spite of true change, I would argue that the data are reliable. Um, The, um, if you look at the 2009 network, and I'll show you a picture of it in a moment, uh, the network compo is composed of 164 countries with a minimum of two links to other nations. There are 11 isolates, that is, countries without connections to any other country, that is, with a million minutes of telephone time or more. And there were 37 pendants, that is, countries <coughs> that were only connected with a single light. The network is very sparse, with a density of about 0.5. Um, <coughs> 0.05. <coughs> it's, 
Um, and if you look at the <coughs> centrality of the network, you'll find that the United States is by far the most central country, um, followed by the UK, Germany, Canada, and Mexico. Um, if you do a uh, either a power law or a decaying exponential, which is what I did here, you'll find that it fits the data very well. Um, and so that you're pretty confident that if you focus on the most central nodes, you're getting a really good description of the network. Um, so the most central nodes are obviously the United States, UK, Germany, Mexico, Canada. Then comes China and India, France, Italy, Spain, Hong Kong, Philippines, interesting, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates, Switzerland, Singapore, Poland, Japan, the Netherlands, and Australia. Um, Um, this is a, um, a graphic representation of the network where a minimum of a million minutes of telephone time is required for a link to be there. The thicker the line, the greater the number of telephone calls. The diameters of the country are their uh, gross domestic products. And the country, the color of the countries indicate their locations. Uh, North America is in green, Europe is in blue, um, I believe. Um, yellow is for Latin America, uh, red for Asia, um, and black for Africa. There are regional clusters in these data, um, which is a fairly new phenomenon, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that is, the South American countries are located on the lower left, Islamic countries in the upper left, the Balkan nations in the upper right, African nations are lower, and the members of the former Soviet Union are to the lower right. Um, um, the results support um, the notion that the global community is organized as suggested by world systems theory. That is, that international telecommunications network is arrayed along the center periphery dimension based upon the wealth of individual nations. Uh, that Gal Johann Galton's uh, structural theory of imperialism, that there are few ties between the peripheral nations and that their communication patterns, communication has to go through uh, the core countries. It also supports Samuel Huntington's notions of civilization, that language, culture, and religion um, helps to form these differentiation. That is, that there are regional clusters with limited communication within the group, and even fewer ties between nations from different regions. This suggests that some combination of theories is required to explain the, the complexity of international communication. <coughs> I don't have that on mine. Uh, oh, yes, I do. There we go. Um, if we look at the data over time, we find some very interesting <coughs> phenomena. The first of which is that density over time has increased approximately nine tenths of a percent per year. But the trend's not been monotonic. The network became denser until the mid 90s with the greatest increase coinciding with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Then it grew spar sparser through the beginning of the century. This is reflected in a significant quadratic, which you don't um, there, um, and it may be attributed to the reintegration of Hong Kong into China and the city's weakening ties to the UK. Since uh, 2000, the network has been relatively um, 
stable. Um, let me also point out um, that the um, uh, network communication patterns have become more concentrated around the core as indicated by the increased Jenny coefficient, which is the green line in the middle. And, um, um, and it has become more centralized around the United States and Western Europe until the mid-90s and then the return reversed itself for the record a decade, perhaps due to changes in East Asia. After 2001, um, it has become pretty stable. If we look at the most central countries, Um, 16 of the most central countries, of the 20 most central countries, remain the same between 1998 and 2009. Uh, the United States, UK, Germany, Mexico, Canada, China, India, France, Italy, Spain, Hong Kong, Switzerland, Japan, the Netherlands, and Australia. The pattern suggests also that Europe is becoming less central being supplanted by the Middle East and um, Eastern East Asia. Um, that is, uh, the smaller European countries, Belgium, Austria, and Sweden, dropped from the most central core countries, being replaced by Singapore and the Philippines. Uh, China rose from 8th to 6th, India from 15th to 5th, France from 5th to 9th, so France went down. China and India went up, um, and uh, Italy from 7th to 8th, and the Netherlands from 12th to 20th. Japan, interestingly enough, fell from 10th to 19th. The ascendancy of India and the Philippines um, is due to their expatriates throughout the world and uh, possibly the drop in the cost of international telephone calls and the diffusion of mobile telephones. Um, what I want to do is show you what the um, network, how the network changed over time. Um, this is an animation that um, from an animation system that I've developed with Ben Benjamin Elbert over the last decade. Um, what I have here are 16 uh, countries. Um, the yellow ones are East Asia. North America is in green. Europe is in red. Australia is in New Zealand, but Australia is in blue. Um, India is in white and that will we'll be able to see it immediately. This is from 2000, um, 1999 through 2009, um, and, um, and it looks pretty nice if I can get it to work. Um, each single one represents a single year. A couple things to point out is notice how um, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan and their relationship to the rest of the world changes. Um, notice um, India popping up in the um, middle. Um, at, over time, as India moves to a position somewhat um, moderate, there it goes, between the United States and UK. 
Uh, also worth noting is Turkey. Uh, Turkey's in red in this data set. I assume that Turkey is in Europe. Uh, notice how Turkey moves from the periphery of Europe to the center of um, northern Europe. Um, again, looking at the relationships between the UK and the rest of the world. Um, what are the axes? The axes are um, orthonormal reference vectors. Um, essentially, they're the results of a multidimensional scaling of, of the, of the uh, social matrices. Um, the lines indicate at least um, 100 million minutes of telephone times between these specific pairs of countries. Um, essentially, what it is is we use the multidimensional scaling layout, and then we uh, rotated each time point so that to minimize the congruence, maximize the congruence between each adjacent year, and then use those plots, and then it's simply an iterative. Um, solution between each point in time. Uh, I can do it again, and may, I hope. Yeah. So 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. Um, and again, then this is just simply how it's changing over time. Uh, and um, <coughs> it's really interesting. And the problem again is trying to show too many countries at once. This is only uh, 16 countries originally plus their ties. Um, So over the last 30 years, the volume of international telephone calls has increased exponentially, about 14% uh, annual growth the, due to micro market liberalization, sharp declines in the calling rates of mobile telephones and calling cards and prepaid services. Basically, um, much of the growth is a result from immigrants, that is, from the Philippines and India, who work throughout the world and um, who work around the world and call home. Um, that is, and if you can see the growth from from uh, 1982, where there are only a billion. Uh, minutes of telephone calls to 2008 were the 376 billion minutes of telephone calls. In spite of the strengthening of the ties among the nation, the overall network has remained relatively stable. Mobile telephone calls account for much of its growth, creating new calling opportunities. India added 112 million new tele mobile telephone subscribers in 2008, more than the total number of telephone, mobile telephones in Germany. China added 89 million, and India and China added 283 million in 2009, more than the U.S. total. Um, and then you have Brazil, Indonesia, and Vietnam that had over 30 million new mobile telephones. Um, 36% of international telephone traffic originates from mobile telephones, at least in, um, in 2008, up from, from 32% in 2007. Mobile 
terminated telephone traffic grew 16% in 2009 and accounted for 52% of international traffic. What's happening is people may be using landlines here, but the call to lesser developed countries who don't have landline infrastructure, they're using the mobile phone. <coughs> Um, so what does the future bring? Um, after exponential growth, the volume of calls may have reached a saturation point in North America, Western Europe, and East Asia. The growth in international uh, call volume was only 10% in 2001, and it was slowest in North America and greatest in Asia. Since 2001, the rate of growth has been from 10 to 15%. Growth in developing countries and developed countries has been about six percent. Uh, forecasts suggest that this will drop to about three and a half percent over the next five years. So we're not calling overseas much. If we um, and part of these are due to technological change. The decline in international telephone communication has due to the displacement of, by the internet, that is email and web 2.0. The correlation between the number of internet hosts and the residuals of the regressions of U.S. international telephone calls over time is, point, is minus 0.783, for, uh, for incoming and outgoing is minus 0.875. Part of this is due to voice over the internet. Um, Internet telephone grew 20 times between 1998 and 2002. International voice over internet grew 23% alone in 2003. In 2004, it was only 11% of calls, or 11% uh, of the total, or 10% of the calls. And then it increased to 19.8% by 2006, with the greatest growth occurring in developing markets, in particular India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, there were 6.9 million voice over internet subscribers in the United States, and we've had 153% growth since 2005. 10% uh, of U.S. households used um, in 2009 were using voice over internet. Um, also, the number of residential lines has declined since 2001. And in Europe, you see a comparable growth from 6.5 million in 2005 to 45 million in 2009. It should be pointed out that today, Skype is the largest provider of cross-border voice communication. Um, Skype grew from 2.8% of international calls in 2005. Um, and to, 300, to 33 billion minutes of, of computer to computer and 8.4 billion minutes of computer to telephone traffic by 2008. And graphically, this looks like this. You see the dark, gr the green is um, voice over internet. The overall growth is the overall curve. You can see it looks like exponential growth overall, but um, uh, but then the rate of growth uh, is the line in the middle, and you can see that somewhere around 2000, you had this great drop. Now, I originally um, wanted uh, years ago trying to look at the impact of the of um, the uh, World Trade Center bombings in 2001 on international telephone traffic. And um, the problem is trying to tease out that from the overall changes in the telephone system. Um, I had thought that it would have the same effect on international traffic as the breakup of the Soviet Union and the reintegration of Hong Kong into China. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this might be the end for this line of research that considers international telephone traffic as representative of international communication. <coughs> it may represent too small a portion of the communication among nations to be a valid indicator of the global system. Uh, 
That's not to say that my research hasn't received a lot of criticism. And it has. <laughs> uh, the first is this research only examines uh, plain old telephone. The second is that, it, that as Professor Mandre and Soren Mackay uh, <laughs> pointed out, that I'm not looking at directional communication, just at the aggregate, although I can show you some directional data. Um, and that although I have <coughs> begin looked at other international networks. Um, as early as 1995, I examined the International Telex Network. Um, but I particularly did that because I wanted to study the disadoption of an international communication technology. Um, Joe Salisbury and I um, used data to examine international monetary flows on the Visa network. Um, and then um, uh, Devin Rosen, um, Bung Su Chan, and I uh, examined the OECD hyperlink flows in 1998, but there was only 29 uh, countries. In 2008, in 1998, this is what it looked like. Um, the blue circle are all the English-speaking countries, and basically the, the uh, international hyperlink network in, 2000, um, in 1998 is basically an English-language only network. Um, this data accounts for 96% of the international internet flows um, for 1998. Um, and it basically is a US, Australian, Canada, UK, and US <coughs> network. Um, since that time, um, I've been studying the international hyperlink network. And with the hyperlink network, for those of you who don't know, are those little embedded clicks that you do all the time. Um, and what we've done is look at the top level domains and the ties between the top level domains. Um, in a study that Hanwu Park and I did in 2000, by, well, done in 2003, we used data from AltaVista that looked at 550 million websites and 356 million hyperlinks, um, primarily English language sites with a very simple algorithm that is what are the domain, what is the link from Canada to the UK and how many are there. Um, I created a USA node by combining those top level domains that were unique to the United States. That is EDU, MIL, GOV, and US. Notice what's missing, .com, .org, .net. So the United States may be more central than what we've reported in those early studies. Um, we collected the data twice. Um, from January and March 2003, but the reliability was very low between them of only 0.624. Part of that was this was the ramp up to the Iraq invasion of Iraq. Um, and if you remove Indonesia, which is a major, which then was the major Islamic hub, um, that the reliability jumped to 0.785. Um, was there a true change? Um, it's hard to tell. Um, to determine the validity of what we did, we looked at 15 random countries with at least 10 web pages, pages per site, and we found that 93.3% of the pages were from the host domain. There were some sources of invalidity. Many countries use the generic top-level domains as a lower-level domain name. For example, um, .edu. AU for Australian educational institutions and uh, Alta Vista, now Yahoo's search algorithm, found the link. The second is that US states use the same names as countries. For example, Colombia and Colorado both use .co, or California and Canada both use .ca, and occasionally the search finds the link. Um, we also look at the bandwidth. What is the physical structure of the internet 
uh, or the bilingual, bilateral bandwidth, the capacity, uh, and we did that for 63 nations. Um, that turns out to be geographically relevant, non-directional, and the data is in megabytes per second. <coughs> and they range from zero, where two nations have had no connection, to 114,000 between the United States and um, the UK. Um, given that, on the internet, we find some very interesting things. If you look at the hyperlink network, we find that Germany has the greatest out degree. That is, Ger the German sites connect most to most other country sites. Um, the greatest in degree link is to the United States. Um, and uh, I don't want to go through all these other measures, except to say on the bandwidth, the United States is the most central, followed by the UK um, and then France. You might be interested for 2003, what about India and China? And if you see, China um, out sends out a lot of links, uh, but um, or links to other countries, but isn't linked very frequently. And um, but of the more peripheral countries in the network, China is much more central. And this will be important when we talk about more recent developments. Um, and then, and you can see that India, IN, which is the one below Israel, um, two down from China, is very peripheral in 2003. Um, the network looks like this. It's one group, very densely connected, centered about the United States. Um, and 50,000 links were required for, uh, for a line to be drawn. The thicker the lines, the greater the, the strength. Um, and the direction of the hyperlink is indicated by an arrowhead. Um, but it's obviously too much data for you to see. Um, and again, the United States, um, is at the center. If we look at the infrastructure, we find a very classical hub periphery system with the United States at the center. Basically, here we did find two groups. We found a group based upon Europe and then um, a group from the United States that included two subgroups of Asia, which is in yellow, and green, which is Latin America. Notice something interesting, that all the international internet flows through the United States, okay. uh, at least structurally, physically. Um, and that's the way we want it to be. Um, if you remember not too many years ago, there was some controversy by AT&T and how the NSA <coughs> had this a little portal on AT&T's thing. Well, um, that allows them to examine international internet flows. Um, and uh, essentially, to get from Asia to um, Europe via the internet, you pretty much have to go through the United States Although there are some weak ties, for example, there's India to, um, to the UK, but most of the ties um, have to go through the United States. And from a cost notion, it might even be cost efficient to go through the United States. Again, these data support Galton's theory, structural theory of materialism and supports world systems theory. Uh, we find um, a little bit of globalization taking place that is increased centralization about the United States and some deglobalization that is regionalization developing since. Um, and let me move on. Um, but world systems theory seems to be incomplete. That is, that there are non-economic factors which um, are very important in determining international telephone and internet flows. First of these is language um, and geography. Um, the second is culture and um, history. 
um, are big. If you have historical relations with them, you tend to uh, have stronger ties. And again, supporting Hun Huntington's notion of regional civilizations. And then what I want to talk about is the long-term cultural convergence, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then the evolution of telecommunications. That is, maybe what you see happening with the internet is simply a reproduction of the older telecommunication system. That is, a reproduction of the telephone system. Um, in my work, I've examined lots and lots and lots of other international networks. International news flows, film flows, student flows, patents, trademarks, and software flows, migrations, um, inter international government organizations, trade, air passengers, freight and mail, international aid, international arms flows, international conflict, um, international music flows, and international book flows. Generally, they all come up with the same pattern. So currently, what am I doing? Um, essentially, I'm replicating the Barnett and Park 2005 on the inter with international hyperlink data from 2009 and 2010. Here I have 273 uh, top-level domains. The data was gathered from Yahoo. Um, I won't be able to gather any more data because Yahoo stopped me from using these APIs to gather the data. Um, and, and my brother-in-law who works at Google said, well, if I was in charge of Yahoo, I wouldn't let you gather that data either. Um, but, you know, like, which countries are next to who? Um, and so the data for 2009 had uh, 33.8 billion websites of the 47 billion websites that, yeah, that the estimates are out there with 9.4 billion hyperlinks. Um, and we're looking at how the network has changed. Uh, a couple things that are really important is that from that .coms, .org, and .net, we don't know where they come from. Well, that's not completely true. I figured out a way to decompose the, um, those generic top-level domains, and um, I have a paper on it uh, that's in where? Uh, Social Science Computer Research and Evaluation score. Um, and also, I'm examining the two-mode network for 160 <coughs> countries by the 100 most frequently used websites that these countries are looking at. We're examining the growth and examining the growth in the international internet infrastructure that is the bandwidth capacity amongst the countries of the world from 2007 to 2010. Um, this is what the hyperlink structure looked like for 2009. And the thing that I want you to want to point out is that for the first time we see subgroups developing on the internet. That is, that there's differentiation that is taking place. That is, in Peter's terminology, the network is evolving. It is evolving in terms of differentiation and size. Here we have a Latin American group developing around Brazil and Argentina to a lesser degree Mexico that connects to the United States. We have on the top, a Russian group um, with Russia and its former Soviet republics. Over here, we have a Chinese language group developing um, that's there. And here, we have a Scandinavian group. Um, and again, you have the core. Um, you might wonder what those funny little bubbles are that are surrounding some of the nodes. There are certain convenient um, top-level domains that have been taken over by uh, business opportunities like uh, Tabala TV and uh, Federation of Micronesia, FM, uh, that have been taken over by commercial purposes. Um, and so while uh, TV is quite central, 
And um, where's uh, FM? I can't see it. Uh, FM is quite central over here. Um, they're not Micronesian and Tabala. <laughs> they're, they're really commercial purposes. Um, but it's really sort of interesting to see that this differentiation has occurred. Okay. Um, and again, this is just the changes in centrality between 9 and 10, uh, between 8, yeah, 9 and 10, and I'm not going to go into that. Uh, essentially, what I did want to point out is the growth in international hyperlinks over time. So here we have 1998, where at 96% of the hyperlinks. In 2003, we had 98% of international hyperlinks. And we had, you know, um, by uh, 2009, we had 9 billion and uh, 14 billion for this year, or last year. Um, <coughs> if we look, I wanted just to show you a little bit. We know which websites which countries are using. And the data come from Alexia.com, which is now bought by Amazon, so we have to use Amazon's APIs. Um, but that com um, has approximately 4 billion outward links and 2.2 inward links. Um, and essentially, what I did is look at all websites that had more than a half a percent of internet users logging on to those sites daily. Um, for 2009, um, that was Google was only 37 percent. Now it's about 50. Facebook was 24. Now it's in the mid 30s. Yahoo's about the same, and YouTube has gone up also. Um, and we looked at all countries for each website with at least five, half a percent of the users. 69% um, of .com use is in the United States, 15%, at least was, 15% India, Japan, 12, and so on. Um, the data look like that. If we look at the um, distribution of websites per daily visit for September 2009, we find, again, a decaying exponential or a, or a, um, a, um, a power law distribution with Google, Facebook, Yahoo, YouTube, Windows Live, and Wikipedia being the most frequently used uh, websites. And again, this um, is a re you know, fits the data very well. This shows what countries are using what websites. A couple interesting things. Uh, this is China, Korea, United States, Japan, uh, India, and Europe. And out here we have um, the Middle East and other things. Um, the websites are in red. The checkered ones are the top 10 most frequently used. Uh, Google is over there. MSN, I think, is here. Uh, Google and Yahoo are the two up there. Notice that China uses its own websites. Um, Korea uses its own websites. Uh, Japan to a lesser degree, but then the United States, um, and then you know, connecting to that. So even that is an interesting uh, finding. <coughs> um, let's see. I don't want to talk about that. So very quickly, why do I do telecommunications research? Well, my research, my study of telecommunication is not on the study of technology per se, but rather on the development and testing of, of social science commu and communication theory uh, that's facilitated by this media. My primary research interest is on the structure of global, the global village, global community, web of nations, or network society. That is, how does this network, that is the world system, change over time as a function of the information that flows between the nations? What we call globalization. Um, I use cultural convergence theory to do this. Cultural convergence theory was first proposed by Everett Rogers and Larry Kincaid in 1981. 
And it suggests that um, in a closed system, actors will converge on a uh, on an average collective pattern of thought that is culture if communication is allowed to continue indefinitely. Uh, participants in the world system will converge on an average pattern of thought that is global culture if communication is allowed to continue the kicker, unrestricted. So, what happens is that the structure of telecommunications and internet flows represents restrictions to the flow of information among nations. That is, unlimited and unrestricted communication between cultures will lead to the reduction in differences and greater similarity of values. Um, however, we have relative bounded groups. As I saw the group in Latin America, there's a group for Islamic countries, uh, Russia, China have their separate groups. Um, and they will converge on a local central thing um, and may not be uh, converge on the overall system. These separate groups are identified through network analysis. Okay. So very briefly, that uh, Larry Kincaid and I developed a mathematical model for this. Then Devin Rosen and I reformulated the theory to take in what we've learned about hybridization, advances in the study of communication, and research on the international communication. Um, two additional propositions we proposed were that the stronger link between actors the greater their reciprocal influence, that is, the faster they would converge on a common set of beliefs. And the greater the proportion of messages initiated by an actor, the more similar the final equilibrium state will be to the initial state of beliefs. In the long term, global culture will be most similar to the nations encoding the greatest proportion of the system's messages. Currently, that's the United States and other countries at the core. But note, folks, that the structure is changing, and that's why we want to look at how the structure changes. India and China are becoming more central. Continental Europe is becoming less central. We have regional groupings with greater concentrations of communication within clusters than to the world community. That is, they have developed in Latin America, uh, Chinese in East Asia, and the former Soviet Union. Okay. Um, and thank you. And I'm willing to entertain any questions. Yes, Tom. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, we're very much interested in the growth of mobile communications in different parts of, of the world. Did your data allow you to do separate uh, charts of the mobile uh, network patterns? No, it doesn't. Not at all? Not at all. And I guess a related question was, since the telephone the pricing differs in different places, particularly whether the caller pays or the receiver pays, uh, I didn't know whether your data, particularly on directionality, but uh, that might be influenced by the question of who's paying. Yes, um, it does. Um, and the interesting thing um, about, um, I've approached Skype to try to get access to their data since they, and I don't know what the final state of it is, it'll probably be another year before Microsoft takes it over completely. Um, to, to try to get those kinds of data because they separate out whether or not the initial comes from telephone, was received by computer, or total computer to computer and so on. Um, the data that I have on that comes from 1998. I'm using the 1998 and we find that cost for the call is a a good predictor of telephone calls, but not a very good predictor. In fact, it doesn't predict at all internet flows. A lot of changes. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, you know, one thing that I was thinking about, George, when you try to look at change in this network or many of these networks over time, the U.S. is so prominent that it would pretty much, I mean, it would create a lot of stability just because of where it is. And I didn't know if you would ever try taking the U.S. out and then looking at the network without the U.S. in it and if you would detect more change. 20% of international telephone calls go through the United States either point of origin or point of destination. I, you know, um, I think if you did that, it would, you would find more regionalization. Um, I, I wonder uh, how true, I don't know what, what, I'm sa what I'm saying is, I mean, I'm sure that we find other things, but how true to the empirical data that is to remove the United States from that analysis. Um, in a lot of the internet studies, they've done that. Okay. Removed the United States because to try to, um, you know, take that into account. When I try to um, do the animations of this and put in the sizes of the various countries in terms of the amount of telecommunication, I can't do it because the United States it takes up the whole screen. Mm in terms of its relative size to the other countries. Do uh, Do you see increased um, direct communication connections um, among countries in the South, say between China and Africa, between China and the Latin American countries? Because there is certainly yeah. like a general trend of building up South to South conversation and economic uh, ties. Um, yes, I don't, I didn't look at, on the telephone data, I don't, I didn't look specifically for that, but that's a good point and I really should. Um, on the internet data, um, I've been analyzing the changes and the residuals of the changes and almost everybody has greater ties to China than would be predicted by the previous years. And that's all I can really say to you about that. But I really should look more closely at that. Yes, I wanted to have identified the three countries with which the Latin, Latin American group has a privileged flow of communications. I presume the one would be the United States, but which would be the other two? Oh, Spain and Portugal. Um, in particular, Spain um, has is a real is in a really interesting position in international information flows as a member of the EU, and at the same time, um, the, for lack of a better word, the cultural I don't want to say hegemon, but something the cultural hegemon of Latin America, or at least of um, of Latin America. That's probably the best word I can think of at this point. Um, and in Portugal, interestingly enough, has ties with Brazil, but Brazil is much more central in, in part because of its population, in part because of its influence in the rest of Latin America than Portugal. Okay. Um, interesting, I look at Japan and um, figuring uh, with the Fujimora thing and all the Brazilian Japanese figuring that to be strong ties with Japan and Latin America, and they're not as strong. Uh, as to the <coughs> to Europe. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm just going to add a uh, observation or a comment here. There was a paper that just was posted on SocialNet about the financial flows among the major corporations in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the stunning findings of this in the light of um, of uh, Occupy Wall Street is that uh, 300 of the largest corporations in the world con control 40% of the world's wealth yep. and that 1,300 corporations control 70% of the world's wealth. Uh, this paper is going to be published uh, online in PLOS, and uh, you might be interested in looking at it more carefully. It's very much along the lines of the kind of work that George has, been, has done. I don't know if you've ever done anything with financial flows. Well, you did mention actually... Um, but that was between countries. That was between countries. Um, and it was really in, in a, using the Visa network 
I, I tried to approach uh, SWIFT, which was the formal bank-to-bank -bank thing, and um, somewhere along the line in my um, in my internet emails got lost in somewhere in Northern Virginia. So <laughs> I don't really want to make the attribution about why that is. But, but I, it's, it's just Visa data, and I, it's a very interesting story about how I got it, but I won't. <laughs> so save that for lunch. Yes. Um, I wanted to mention that we have a job candidate who will be here this Thursday. Uh, and the meeting is going to be here in this room at 1.15. His name is Matt Carlson from St. Louis University. He did his PhD work at uh, Annenberg Penn. So please feel free to come and join us with that. Next week, our, our uh, uh, Annenberg Research Seminar is going to be given by Lena Densick who's a research fellow at Central European University, and uh, that also will be a job candidate talk. So by all means, come and, uh, and listen to her because we value your input as we get to making our decision. Would you join me in thanking George for... <laughs>